There's a bit of an allusion to judging, and sometimes judges think that the uh, smooth chow is a little better balanced than the rough. But when you think about it, if you've got a rough chow with a lot of coat, you have three inches of hair on the fore chest, maybe three inches on the back end, and three inches, you know, of hair going around. So you really have to look at the dog and structure, not just the total outline. You know, all breeds have distinctive features, you know, which makes up the type. And in Charles, they probably the one, the three distinctive features is the blue-black tongue. I think the only other mammal that has a blue-black tongue is the sharp hay. And at some point, the two breeds must have been uh, related. And I forget what the other mammal is. I think it's some kind of a bear has a black tongue. The, uh, the scowling expression on the chow is distinct with the breed, and the stilted gait. There's no other breed that quite has the stilted gait of a chap. It's interesting too that what, as far as size, we do now with AKC, we have a recommended size between 17 to 20 inches. But for many, many years, there was no mention of size in the standard whatsoever. They could be any size. I myself prefer the bigger dogs, but I think you have to keep in mind that looking at the breed, whether you like the larger dog, the smaller dog, the basic thing is balance, not the size. And also, too, when we're talking about balance, you know, we talk about sturdy, heavy bone, but the bone has to be in proportion to the size of the dog. I mean, you don't want bone that big on a 17 inch dog. And you know, the, the bigger the dog, you know, the framework, the larger the bone you want to have. But please always remember the words active, agile, and alert. And also to, we did, we're one of the few standards that does mention in judging the breed that dual, dual allowance has to go to the bitches. You know, the bitches never carry the characteristics as strong as a male. Well, first of all, they don't carry as much coat. You know, they're not as large bone. And you wouldn't call it too. You always want a chow bitch to be feminine. Sorry to say, some of the bitches that have been done a bit of winning are a little heavier type dogs. But those bitches that are a little bit more of them, most of them never produce, and I don't know why. Maybe it's they're carrying too many male hormones, but I think you do see that sometimes in other breeds, too. They really doggy bitches don't produce. The head of the chow is basically very easy to understand. It's two squares. You know, the smaller uh, square is the muzzle, and the, the larger square of the uh, skull. And, you know, the muzzle, that's easy to understand. It's a perfect square. The length, the depth, and the width should all be equal. You know, and it's the same with the skull, the three parts. Depth, width, and length should be equal. So it's two squares, you know, with a small square on the large square. And the muzzle, the one thing to keep in mind, you want a nice thick padding of the skin. It should be good and thick, like a sharp padding. But you never want to see wrinkles, or they can have a slight wrinkle on the muzzle, you know, the padding, but basically you don't want a lot of wrinkle because it takes away from the clean look. The child should always have a clean look. It shouldn't be all heavily wrinkled. And for some reason, we've gone through periods where people thought, you know, the more the better, but they got to the point where they were just, they look like sharp eggs. The eye is quite basically simple. You know, it's a uh, almond-shaped eye. The color is dark. The uh, correct, ex oh, excuse me. You know, the correct expression in any breed goes with eyes and ears. If you don't have the proper eye and the proper ear, you're never going to get the right expression. And the eye should be deep set, almond-shaped, moderate in size, and set well apart. If there is too much loose skin around the eye, the eye is going to look extremely deep set and too small. I mean, we have, I think we're getting away from the 
But there, there was a point at one point, you really had to search to find the eyes. And I mean, I saw the likes of some really good judges actually excuse Charles out of the ring when they couldn't even find their eyes. You know, the standard calls for an homicide, I wouldn't call it a matter of semantics. I think the eye myself is more of a triangle than honor. Because in the inside, you have that line that really becomes, you know, an almond is like a, uh, yeah, like a, like the shape of an almond, where it's not quite that of a child, it's more of a triangle. Yeah, the triangle. The ear is small, thick, and also triangular, with a slight tilt forward. You know, and the ear should be set right at the top, not at the top, but right at the edge of the top of the skull. If you get an ear that's set too close together, they look like a rabbit. Or if they're set to the side, they start to look like an elephant. And the one thing, and it's just a slight tilt forward. You don't want them to stick straight up. You do get some dogs that ears are a bit loose, and when they move, the ears are kind of floppy. Which is a no no. The ears should be kind of stiff and erect. Next question. When you, when you judge a child, and uh, you hardly see the eyes really the wrinkles, and you have to move them, but then, I mean, okay, there's no, there's no, there are no fears. You know, it's just that you have to open the eyes and the What is that? Is it bad? It's bad, yes. I mean, it, 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 it kills the expression. You know, in any breed, if you can't see the eye, you know, yeah. What about when you, when you see the eye, hearing, and they can hardly, you know, the readers are okay, but the eyes are the watery and it looks like it's bothered. It's not. Yeah. What do you do? You send out? You send out? Yeah. I wouldn't suggest bringing it because the ribbons ran. <laughs> and I, I don't recall ever seeing Mr. Ribbon. I wasn't there seeing him throw one out of the ring, but I've seen Mr. Sabella, Sam, throw some of them out of the ring. Okay, so as a judge, if their eyes are not clear and they're watery and they get hearing and they get blinking, they should be done. I think they should be excused. For something for our judges has to know. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I'm sure it was everywhere in the world. The breed was for a while. There was a lot of entropia. There really was. And you know, a lot of people said it was because of the loose skin. When I first started breeding, we had a lot of it, and I would, I would breed some dogs that had it because, you know, then they got a little better before the surgery. When they were youngsters, they sort of put a little bit of oil in the eyelid to keep it from, you know, and then they grow out of it. But today we don't see that many childs with bad eyes in the rank, thank God. But if you do, you should excuse that. I would excuse it. Because, I mean, basically, if that eye is tearing on that, there's something there that's not right. I mean, it's not, it's not normal health. Thank you. And the one thing, too, before I forget about normal health, that they did put in the standard quite a few years ago. Any dog that had, they called it abdominal breathing, where you can see they were breathing from the stomach, uh, what do you call it? It's a terrible no no. I mean, they should be easy breathers. I mean, as I said, they're an all-purpose dog. They're used for pulling, you know, guarding, uh, hurting. I mean, you can't have a dog pulling, pulling something that can't breathe. So when you hear a child turn on the words, when you hear we did a gun or a sound. Yeah, you send it out? Or, put it, or you don't put it out? I just wouldn't put it up. And I have the thing with any breed, if they can't breathe right, you know, 
I don't know any breed I would excuse for not being able to breed. I mean, even a, uh, just a dog that's bred for a, a lap dog. You know, if you want to take the dog for a walk, you don't want it to drop dead. And we did have at one point, the breathing was so bad in chows, with the soft palates. There were uh, dogs going to like a training class, puppies, and would keel over from not being able to breathe. You know, and one part of the head is the nose, which is fairly simple. Large, black, and well-open nostrils. You know, and I, I mean, you do, which goes along with the breathing. If they don't have a nice, open nostril, they can't breathe properly either. I mean, they've got to really have a good, open nostril. And I mean, it's the same in any breed. You do see sometimes some of the toy breeds, like a Pekingese, for example, sometimes they get such a heavy wrinkle it pushes down on their nose. Oh, that's not right either. But just remember, you know, that the nose is part of what they were bred to do. With a tight little nostril, they couldn't do the work they were bred to do. The neck is simple. You know, it's strong, moderate length, but it needs to have enough length to have a bit of an arch to it. So when they go around the ring, they should be able to arch the neck so they have a very proud carriage. You know, and that neck goes along with active vaginal alert. You know, a chow should really have beautiful carriage. Never clumping around the ring when the head just hung down. The four quarters are quite basic. You know, it's a moderate angle to, uh, with the legs set well under the body. You know, you don't want the front angle. This angle is a lot of breaks because of the hindquarter to balance off a little bit. So you think about it, I can't think of any breed this is straight hindquarters and chow. Can you think of any breed? Jesse, a question again. Jesse. Jesse, question. Yeah. yeah, when you say straight, I just want to, so everyone can hear. When you say straight, I am. So, when you judge a chow, you go hold the hands to check it straight, correct? Right? Well, I don't, I think you can even see it. But so I mean, when you see the dog standing there, then what do you call it? The hock, the hock should be perfectly below the hip joint. Yes. Okay. And I mean, I don't think you even have to feel it. I think you can see it. Even sometimes with grooming, they're able to create an uh, angulate, a rear angulation. See, like it's just rear angulation. When, when, they, when they groom it sometimes, they put some rear angulation in the box. I think the one thing that you have to be careful when you're looking at them, and luckily we've gotten away from it, but you know, back a few years ago, there were a lot of chows that had double hocks. That hock could rock forward and backward. And today, sometimes you see, it's not with the, uh, the red dogs or the black dogs, but the shaded red dogs with the different markings, for some reason, right at that hock joint, they will have a, what they call a lighter marking, and sometimes it gives you the illusion that that hot's not perfectly straight. And you know, you don't have to see the double hocks of movement even. When they're standing still and they just shift the weight, if you see that hot going forward, you know it's a double joint. And luckily the breed has gotten away from it. And you know, it's interesting though, because when they did a video for the AKC of the Chow's movement, we had we picked up two Chow's that we were looking at when we were on blacktop, and that had beautiful stilted gait. And the way and we took them over to the grass area to do the actual filming, they were not quite as good. For some reason, the Chow's, like, at home in the winter time, if there's a lot of snow and they're going, they do pick up and bend their side foot when they're in snow, but when they're on a hard surface. But when they're on a hard surface, you can practically 
that foot practically uh, is shuffling on the ground. You know, they covered ground, even though it's a dead straight rear, they cover ground because they, the hind quarter, it swings like a pendulum. It swings like a pendulum, so they cover ground. But that foot is staying very, very close to the ground. They're not cranking and bending that stifle. If you do, as I say, though, if you do get them in longer grass, they, their movement will change a little. They will pick up and bounce. Have seen many, I've seen some this. Who, without child, the color of that, ah, they have rear And the breed did go through at one point. I think we've gotten away from it. But in the States, it got really bad. They wanted everything extreme. The heads were so overdone, they didn't even look like that. They got put into these short legs because the whole body was out of proportion. I mean, we just, this foot, as I said, Will Jr. said when he did the book, probably the 30s, a short legged child is an abomination. An abomination. And uh, yes, um, another question. A child is supposed to be moved around very slowly. Yes, sure. Right? Yes, yes. 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 There's many. I have seen some judges who like to make them move fast. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 What breed, well, I don't know about around the world, but in the United States, every breed is race fast. They move to the East fast. All the toy breeds. I think also some ties, at least for each breed, it's also not all breeds are moving in the same way. So I feel a lot of the same way to run with pack. Pack has been spread on the road. And the child, when it goes, they're made properly. You know, they do have a stilted gait. It's much easier to see, and I think they will use their hind quarter better than if you try to race them. If you try to race them, they start to lose a little bit of that stilted gait. You know, talk about all breeds. I was recently looking at a tape of Westman, maybe 65 or the late 60s, and the sporting group. All the handlers, like the fighters, they're just walking the dog down and back. No, they weren't facing it. But I'm not sure there's any great today that we don't move too quickly. There's another question. I'm done. You have the. When I judge, I see a lot more quality in the rock. There are very few times in the country. Now, I think in the States, that in recent years, that we've had some smooth and we've got quite a bit of winning. And we have, we've had some really good, we've had some really good stories. And you know, I used to think it was just an illusion, but with the uh, smooths, a lot of them, you know, their ears look bigger. And I'd say, well, to myself, because you know, you don't have the hair to hide them. But if you really look carefully enough, a lot of the smooths, it just seems to go, certain characteristics go with certain genes, but the smooths, a lot of them, their ear is bigger. Yeah, but here yeah, it's bigger. Well, I think that it's like, uh, you know, the 
And as I said before, sometimes the smooths appear to have a better balance than the rough because they don't have all the hair making them look. And for some reason, a lot of the exhibitors don't pick up. They brush all the front of the chow up. And the pants in the back, they, uh, they brush them out. And a chow, you should never see the dog is trimmed. It's to be totally natural. Well, believe me, when I was showing chows, you could never tell that they were trimmed, but they were trimmed like hell. And that, you know, the, what do you call it, the front, I would use my fingers or a stripping knife. The underline, if the hair was too long, I'd take a cigarette or a cigar and I'd cinch it. You know, the pants, the pants I would use a, a, a stripping knife. You know, because I always wanted the chow to not have a lot behind the butt and not all this up here, and a lot of, not a lot of hair underneath. You know, because they're a perfectly square dog. And sometimes you have to change the illusion a little bit. But you should never see. And sorry to say, I don't know why, but I saw a lot of it when the breed became popular in China. You could just see they trim. They just shave the, the chest of the dog. Well, I mean, that's a no-no. I mean, you know, the only reason they're doing that is because the dog is so out of balance. Yeah. Who is the dog in Yeah. You know, you should, you should breed, the genes should determine the balance, not one's sitters. You know, because you can trim the hell out. I had a dog a couple of years back, or many years ago, and uh, he was a good sire. But he was what I called a total fooler. You know, I had him looking like a million dollars. And he was glamorous because he carried the coat and all that. But everybody said to me, Does he, why aren't you got a special lap dog? And I said, because he's a fooler. He's not what I believe in. You know, and I could have got a lot of winning with him. But believe me, he was a, a real fooler. And I didn't want to show him because, you know, I used to spend a lot of time every week getting my dogs looking right. This dog took three times as long because I had to do a lot of fooling for them. <laughs> and the one thing too about, we put it in the standard back quite a few years ago, and it's true. The quality of the coat is far more important than quantity of coat. You know, some of the dogs that have a bad coat, softer coat, they grow it. But that goes back to being an arctic breed. You should be able to take a chow and hit them with a pressure hose, and that dog should be able to shake and be perfectly dry. When you go to bathe the chow, it's quite hard to get to shampoo them to get, get down to that undercoat. Because as you're hitting them with a hose, you know, they'll shake and it'll be perfectly dry. But when you think about it, if they don't have the proper coat, they couldn't have survived. I mean, these are an Arctic dog. I mean, you wouldn't put up an Alaskan Malibu with a soft woolly coat, would you? But it's the same with a chap. And I, I don't think that what he called the coats are a major problem. Most of the dogs do have uh, pretty good coats. You know, in colors and material, whatever color they are. Except the only thing, it was years ago, the uh, cinnamons, which is a farm, and the blues became very, very popular. And if you keep breeding the dilutes, you, uh, you start to lose some of the pigment. And that also, too, for some reason, the dilutes carry more of a thyroid problem than the other colors. And I think maybe in some other breeds, too, that the dilutes carry... But it is amazing that how uh, 
certain characteristics go with certain, certain colors. And we were very lucky in Chow's. We got into a period where we had this skin disease where you know the skin turns black and all the hair falls out. And at the time of what it caught, there was a dog, and I still remember the dog, and everybody was breeding for him. But the university, one of them down there, Davis, was saying it wasn't a hereditary problem. Well, and the dog was owned by a veterinarian, but you know, everything we were seeing that was coming down with the problem was from this one dog. And uh, it was interesting too because if you neutered them, it used to be able to cure the problem, but they still haven't gotten a handle on it. And this dog, too, besides what it called, throwing the, uh, the coat issue, he also threw the breathing problem. You know, he had a very bad soft palate. So you had dogs that, you know, they had no hair and they couldn't, they couldn't breathe. You know, everybody said, why didn't you breathe to so-and-so? I said, I don't want a dog that can't breathe and it's naked, you know. In closing, the temperament. You know, a chow is an aloof dog. You know, well, many breeds are aloof. But I mean, never, never, never forgive a shy dog or an aggressive dog. I mean, that is not, every, every dog should be enjoyable to live with. I mean, I would never have a dog that I couldn't trust with anybody in this room. You know, because there's show dogs where many a time, you know, I couldn't get to the dog show or somebody at the dog show where, you know, they have to go off with someone else. I mean, they've got to be, what do you call it, uh, they can be aloof, but never shy and never aggressive. The only thing is with the temperament of a child, because of the perif peripheral vision, when you go up to approach a child, always come from the front and put your hand under your chin. Don't put their hand up on top of their head. They just don't like when you come up and even when you're petting one here in the lobby or something, don't come up on top of them. Come from underneath. And I've noticed too that even when you're opening the mouth of a chow, that what it come? If you can open their mouth without getting much of your hand in front of their eyes, they're always much better. You start to get what they can't see. I mean, it's like you know, a lot of dogs that, yeah, say a, a Sky Terrier, for example. You know, I've never once had a problem with that. I remember years ago when I was a kid, most of them you. But, uh, you know, if you go up to a Sky, the first thing I do is put my hand under the chip and then pull their hair back. Usually the handler exhibit it pulls hair, so they see it. But I mean, when you think about it, if you couldn't see someone and they grab you, would you tend to either back away or go at them? I know I would. You know, and then after I looked at them, I'd say, well, which one do I want to do? You know. <laughs> As a judge, as a child man, how do you approach a child, how do you go over a child, do you have the best words, just so that we hear from you. Okay, come up at them, and from the front, and you know, sorry to say our, uh, the video that was done of the Chow examination, it was done with the judge kneeling in front of them, which should never be. I mean, never kneel in front. I don't think you should kneel in front of any dog. You know, when you think about it, you're kneeling in front of a dog. If that dog comes at you, the only way you're going to get away is if you do a right? You know, if you've got your face in, in front of them, they're going to get you right on the face. And as I said, when you go to the child, you know, put your hand under their chin. Under the chin. Yeah. And right forward, never from the side. And also, two chows are way up. They're much more comfortable when they're judged on a ramp. You know, they're much more comfortable on the ramp. You know, because it's probably because you're not coming down on top of them. And I remember many years ago that there was a great man, he from England, Percy Whitaker. I and mean, he did our national. If he saw a dog he even suspected might be the least bit of, he would put them on a table, which we're not allowed to put them on a table, you know, but he would judge them on a table. Uh, 
But I think there's other breeds too. I mean, that's why a lot of breeds, that if it's a breed that you examine on the table, they tell you never go back and cut the dog on the ground. Yeah, I mean, when you think of, I don't know. No, I mean, you're, you're already, if any dog low to the ground, you know, and for some reason, if you wanted to touch a dog, for some reason on the ground, I don't know why you would, you know, I would get down to their level, you know. Yeah. Yeah, he'd come back to the table. No, but I mean, when you think about it, you know, you're what, six feet tall? Would you want a uh, 20 foot tall man preaching on you? Does any, I'm sure I forgot to touch on certain things. But, you know, it's just, I think most of the things I touched on are the basics. You know, oh, when, what do you call it? That they made a big point when they changed the standard about it not being a head breed. Well, about 40% of the written words are on the head. You know, because they go into such details, you know, here, there, and everything. But in any breed, every... You know, some breeds heads more important than others, but the what do you call it? I mean, every breed's a head breed. When a bunch of dogs stick their head over the fence, you should be able to tell which breed it is just by looking at the face. And the one thing about the head's a little bit different. You know, because I said they're an Arctic breed, but when you think about it, the chow is a square on a larger square muzzle of that. Where I think nearly all Arctic breeds are all wedge shaped. Is there another, are there any Arctic breeds not have a wedge shape? I think all Arctic breeds have a wedge shape except for the chow. And then again, we did, we have changed the head. When you look at the original chow, it did have a wedge shaped head. It was more like a Samoyed head. And the whole body was more like a Samoyed. So, another question is the wrinkles. How much wrinkles can a chow have? What? How much wrinkles can a chow have? It shouldn't be too much. You know, the scowl comes from the eye, the ear, and over the scowl comes you have you have the furrow running there between the skull, the slight furrow, and over each eye you have sort of a padding. It looks like a button nearly on the brow, a little skin, like a button of skin. And that's what gives the scowl. The what do you call it? They, if you get a dog with a lot of wrinkle, that's not a scowl. I would call it a, a sour look, you know. I mean, a dog with a lot of wrinkle can't be dignified. The scowl is a very dignified look. And you're not going to have a dignified dog that's all wrinkles. I mean, would I look so pretty if my face was all wrinkles? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can. Okay, for the what it call, for the what it call it. Yeah, you want it. Yeah, because of the, and because of the what it call, they uh, they do carry a lot of coat. You do want to feel, you want to feel that skull. I mean, that should be a good wide skull. You know, yeah. And I mean, nothing on a chow should ever be narrow anywhere. But I think you can see that you're talking about the parallel planes. Well, you can. 
I think, you know, basically, I think you can see those planes. Okay, the ear, it's a small triangular, slightly rounded at the tip, slightly rounded at the tip, and, yeah, and they, it's a slight tilt forward, but it should be stiff. I mean, the ear should never be soft, because if the ear is soft, doesn't have a hard cartilage, when they move, it'll bounce. And you do occasionally, I haven't seen one in years, but we used to see some chows that we called a drop ear. If you, you see them, I think, I haven't seen one in years, thank God. But it's a, a disqualification, a drop ear. I don't think you have to touch. You can, you can see. But you see it soft, then you see the movie. I had a chow quite a few years ago, and when he was a baby, that one of, I think that one of the other puppies had bitten him in the ear, and that the vet said not to stitch it, so we didn't stitch it, but it bent backwards a little bit. It was had a little backward tilt, but you really, the only way you, when you, if you felt it, with all the hair, you didn't see it. Luckily, luckily it went backwards slightly. If it had come forward, if it had come forward, it would have made that ear look like it was going to be dropped. But there was only one judge who was Ramona that court. Ramona was the only one that ever picked up that. I must have shown the dog hundreds and hundreds of times. And she said, does he, what happened to this ear? I said, it's an accident, it's a puppy. Um, when judging a child, they can be a bit shy, right? They can be a bit... Aloof. Okay, aloof. How, how, how forgiving to the judge be? Should you be able to open the mouth? Some, some child... <laughs> it's a personal thing. I always, myself, when I was showing the childs, I always preferred that the judge opened the mouth. I did. Because when I, you know, I'm saying I'm trying to show God, and if I had to do it, usually they thought, oh, Desi's trying to play with it. They start wiggling around, looking up at me. And I had my dogs trained that anybody could open their mouth. And that's the thing, besides the mouth, the tongue, you know, if they have a pink spot on the tongue, it's a deep huge. But you want the whole mouth, the gum, and the whole mouth to be as dark as possible. As dark as possible. The darker the better. The darker the better. I mean, I would like to see a rat ball basically black. Sorry to say we've lost a little bit of the pigment. It's gone. Next spot. Okay, if the dog does not have a pink spot on the dog, it's not a disqualification. But if you've got a dog that's got an extremely light tongue, and the gums are pink, and the inside of the lips are pink, 
I would not give it a high award. I would not. I mean, it's the way to The pigment, it's one of the three distinct features of the breed. You know, the pigment, the hind quarter, and the scowl. I mean, they're the three features of the breed. I totally agree, but uh, I, in my opinion, it should be also very shocking in the start of this. Because, in, okay, in our start, sometimes, especially I see in the English words, so it's not the, the case of the Chow Chow. When you go to read the, the falls, there is nothing, nothing. <coughs> But does the standard explain the uh, how uh, important it is to have the dark? You know, they call it blue black. The darker, the better. Does he have? Do you have that? Do you have that in your standard? The darker, the better. Or? Yeah, it is. It is. It is in the standard mentioned and about this. But uh, there is nothing. Uh, if there is uh, nothing written in, in the case that you don't find this. That should be mentioned. It should be, I think, uh, written in the forms, serious forms, because in, in that case, I think we have to, uh, to, to, to go uh, down with the, the grain, but at least you can give back. It's a serious fall if the breed is lacking in a breed feature. I mean, you have a disqualification after two hours, but if they did have a disqualification, it wasn't a DQ, but you had a great one that weighed eight pounds, well, you wouldn't give it much of an award, would you? Yeah, for example, in the Chihuahua standard, there is the disqualification. Yeah, you have the DQ. So that is easy. Because yeah. you can do that. There is a for a weight, there is a for more there is a for uh, prime out, there are disqualifications. So, so not in the case of the child. So yeah, and luckily with the child, you don't have to worry about the mouse. It's rare you see a child with you know, the teeth aren't really perfect. We don't see mouse that are off, thank God. Well, it is, you know, it's, yeah, it's one of the three distinct features of the chow, that stilted gait, and as I said, it moves like a pendulum. Yeah, it should never bend. And I mean, yeah, you're not going to win a cup. You're going to get some that are not perfect, but I certainly, you know, I wouldn't give best in show to a child that didn't have a good stilted gait. And you hope if you're judging a major show, you know, in depth of quality, that your best of breed winner is going to have a nice stilted gait that is not cranking its hocks. Yes. Like no, never. Yeah, and in the front, the same thing. Swing like the pendulum. You know, there should be no break in a fast swing. And the feet, that's why some chows on a hard surface, you can hear them. They're practically, yeah, they're shuffling. They're so close to the ground. So that's another feature of the breed. Yeah, I mean, that's... Then, you know, the three features of the breed are the stilted gait, the tongue, and the scalp. You know, you take that scowl away and make the head a little bit out of wedgie, it's gonna, it's just going to look like some other Arctic breed. Well, going back, I think uh, 
Uh, when you just remember uh, reading somewhere, you can actually feel Oh yeah, I mean, you uh, yeah. just write our finger, you just take your finger, you can, uh, and usually, usually you don't even have to put a finger there, but in uh, way cross, you can see it, but a lot of times they just stand there, they shouldn't be away, you can see that dog. But you know, a lot of breeds have it, I don't know, uh, a lot of toy breeds, like oh, yeah. Shih Tzu's, I don't know, Shih Tzu's not just put back and forth. I say to the people sometimes, what about these socks? And they go, oh, what are you talking about? They don't even notice it. You know. We are eating to the healthy of the dogs. I think that we don't need more typical to the child. Because of the very typical reality it is not a good health in the dogs. What's happening? It's for me, if uh, we're thinking to the health, uh, healthy of the dogs, uh, we don't need a mom in the in the no day, we don't need a very typical movement in the ear, in the child, because uh, it is many problems for the health. The, the still can't you think yes. it's not healthy? Yes. Because I have many friends with child, I don't know you, but many friends with a champion, 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 and uh, all dogs have operated to the knee one, two, three times. And yeah, I think that is not all uh, But then what do you call it? The straight hawk? Many breeds, yeah, but many breeds that have well angled hawks have as much patella problems as the child. I mean, look at toy breeds. I mean, look at poodles, for example. Poodle has a lot of angulation. Most toy poodles or cocker spaniels. There's much more bad ha uh, stifles in cocker spaniels than poodles. We don't, and I, you're right. The one thing about, sometimes people have uh, a chow, they, they have to do the surgery, the patella, the scoring. They say, well, it was an accident. And usually it is an accident. But even though it's an accident, there was a weakness there to begin with. I've had chows that could be up on a rock this high and jump off, they would never do it. Then you have another dog, somebody just bumps it the wrong way. I mean, I think it's a more serious problem than hips, bad patellas. But I mean, it's, it's, it, it, but it has nothing to do with a straight hind quarter, really, I don't think. And that the poodles, cocker spaniels, uh, Breeds with a lot of angulation had more problems. And all the chows I ever had, and all the dogs I ever had, I had very few that ever had a patella problem. And believe me, I wouldn't. Yeah, and I wouldn't work out. And it's the way it The people, it's hard to say, they say it was an accident, the patella, that the dog had an accident. Yeah, but there was a weakness there to begin with. And, you know, they fixed the dog. And then you see the puppies by that dog, they have the problems. It's, I think the patella problem is worse than hips. I had a chow that was severely dysplastic. I wouldn't let anybody free from him. He had the best movement anybody ever saw in a child's rear. He also dreaded that he was totally stable. But uh, <coughs> it's that patella problem will come back to haunt him. It's worse than hips. I mean, a lot of these dogs that are severely dysplastic, they live to 14 years old, never have an unsound day in their life. But it's not, the, the chow does not have as many uh, problems with the patellas as most breeds do. So I don't think it's caused by the straightness. And we have to have an order of food now. Important. 
this uh, Gordon Center over-angulated Doberman. So this is, I think, is a problem that we have in all grids nowadays with this uh, rear that are not in balance at the front, especially in some part of our world. Sorry to say, I think uh, most I see in America is well, I think the problem too is a lot of dogs are overangulated in the rear, but I think the worst problem is the front assemblies. And I mean, so many breeds, the fronts are stick straight. I, for me, uh, I think really I see this problem, but uh, at least for me, I like to see balance between the population But there is an old saying, I think it's true. It's easier for a good front to pull a bad rear than it is for a great rear to push a bad front. And a lot of breeds, the uh, people don't seem to care about the fronts. We've had, we've had breeds in America. We've changed the standard, but some of our smart dogs to allow them to be a little straighter in the front. But when you think about it, I'm using a poodle, for example. You have a standard poodle, for example. It sticks straight in the front, sticks straight in the front, and over-angulated in the rear. When that dog goes around the ring, in order to balance himself, what does he do? He throws his head back. He gets his head back. Very true, what over. you see. Yeah, yeah. So that Because they use that as a balance. Yeah, yes. But some people like it, and even breeders, because the fact they say, oh, it's a poodle. Back, no, throwing its head back. I mean, these are a sporting dog. A poodle shouldn't go around the ring with his head thrown back. You know, it should be slightly forward. I, I think many of these problems you can summarize by saying they're caused by extremism. And if people will be reasonable about the amount to which they carry these, these whether it's movement or heads or breathing or whatever, you solve 50% of the problems immediately. So I think it, it, it's extremism that gets us in trouble. And just for example, here, it, Chows are a perfect example, and Mr. Bivell backed me up. We did get 30 years ago or longer, we got so extreme. They wanted to have this, they wanted more room, they wanted more bomb. I mean, they just became a disaster. Uh, exaggeration. I mean, when you think about it, there's nothing exaggerated about a shower. You know, I guess you could call it an exaggeration. I'm not sure if you think of this right And then the pavement. But other than that, there's nothing exaggerated about the shower. I think it should be nothing exaggerated in any breeds, because I think nowadays this is our problem. You see many, many breeds with the real. For me, we should never forget the, the, the classic type, I mean, because even for breeding, not only for when we are judging, I think that this is a, a big problem that we have nowadays. It's fleshy dogs. And okay, I think like uh, Italian, we were giving 15 years ago so much importance to the heads. Italian and France, we are, uh, we grow up with the school of the head, but nowadays, with sound soundness, it's so important that I, I believe myself that it's not only, only type, it's not only head type, but it's also the soundness, because I think this is the problem. We have today in many but do you, do you think that the, don't you think the majority of breeds in the world today that extremism exaggeration has crept in to all breeds in one form or another whether it's 
Next is uh, what? I, I generally put it on the basis that moderation would serve you well. Yeah, as I said to start with, any breed, when you think about what was the, uh, the breed bred to do, you know, and like the child, as I said, it was a pulling dog, a herding dog, a guard dog. Well, they couldn't do it if they were exactly Our time up? Yes, now and thank you, Dicky, for bringing up some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.